This week, Oda decides to do exactly what I thought he would do, which is to cut away from Shanks and Elbaf to focus on the story revolving around the Straw Hats. So instead, we get a matchup for Sanji against Jimbei Seraphim, and unfortunately, we also get Usopp and Lilith being turned to stone by the green blood powers of the Mero Mero no Mi. By the way, the design of the Devil Fruit was recently revealed in a One Piece magazine to look like a pair of cherries. Now, I think it's very important to notice that even though Frankie gets kicked and he does begin to turn to stone, there's a part of his face that doesn't fully get turned to stone, or at least we don't get to see him fully get turned to stone 100%. And this is because the attack that S Snake uses on him, which is Perfume Femuru, that attack is different than the one that hits Usopp and Lilith. So with Perfume Femuru, only the surrounding area of where the user, of where the Devil Fruit user makes contact will turn to stone, not the entire body all at once. So it's very interesting to me that from where we leave off, Frankie's mouth is still free. And I say that's interesting because as previously mentioned, there's that whole theory about Kuma's devil fruit, the pawpaw fruit, potentially being eaten by one of the straw hats and Frankie being one of the main candidates to potentially do so. Now the petrification of Usopp, Lilith, and York sets in motion a plot point that needs to be resolved. Because at the very least, Usopp needs to be turned back to normal. Now the issue with that is, is that if we go back to the confrontation between Boa Hancock and Blackbeard, Boa specifically says that the user who casts the spell, the user who turns people into stone, is the only person that can undo that. They're the only person that could turn people back to normal. So even if that user dies and somebody else gets that power, the next user will not be able to undo the petrification. And that rule was specifically mentioned before the beginning of this arc so that we knew what we were getting into with this power. And so based on how we see the devil fruit weakness and how the energy of the sea interacts with S Snake, even though she just has the green blood, based off of that, I think it's logical to conclude that the rules of the original devil fruit still apply here in this case. So what are the options in terms of turning people back to normal here? I think there's like three options and I'm gonna go from least likely to most likely. So number one, we recently saw that Law was able to free himself from Doc Q's devil fruit power with hockey. As I mentioned before, we also saw Gear Force Luffy freeing himself from Doflamingo's parasite technique with hockey as well. So an unlikely scenario here would be that Usopp gets a hockey boost for whatever reason and is able to bust himself out of the stone. Now we already saw that Usopp is capable of seeing through stone walls in Dress Rosa. And then also in Film Red, we saw that Usopp was able to have and maintain a connection between him and his father, even though they were both in different dimensions. So it's unlikely, but maybe that comes into play in some way, shape or form. Especially Especially because that can connect to Luffy being able to hear the voice of all things, similar to Roger, right? We know that Roger was able to hear or sense the Poneglyphs, the, the voices of the Poneglyphs. So if Roger could do that with a block of stone, I'm pretty sure that Luffy will be able to do that with one of his closest friends, even though he's turned to stone. Another option here is that they take the statues to Boa, or that Boa shows up for whatever reason, and given the fact that S Snake was actually created using Boa Hancock's DNA, then maybe it turns out that the real Boa Hancock, the original one, is actually capable of lifting the petrification. And then of course, the last and probably most likely option is that somebody with enough authority in the command hierarchy actually commands S Snake to undo the petrifications. However, if it does turn out that the traitor is actually a satellite and there hasn't been any sort of malfunction in the programming of the Seraphim, I think that means that the only person that would be able to command S Snake to undo the petrification would be Saturn. Also, if the traitor is a Vegapunk, I actually think that the Vegapunks that are currently turned to stone are safe from being the traitor. Because I think that turning themselves to stone willingly just to go along with whatever plan the traitor has is too much of a risk just so that nobody suspects them. So what I'm trying to say is that I don't think Lilith or York are the traitor. It also appears that both Judge and Caesar are going to be tracking down and trying to hunt down Vegapunk. Now, one of the reasons for why Judge might have a grudge against Vegapunk is because we know that after Vegapunk discovered DNA or the lineage factor, the world government felt threatened, just like it's feeling right now, and decided to arrest Vegapunk. Eventually, Mads got absorbed into the government, so Caesar and Vegapunk ended up working for, for the government, and then Judge escaped. Now, the problem with Caesar is that his focus was on developing weapons gas weapons of destruction, and so he was dismissed by Vegapunk. So that kind of explains his grudge. But then when it comes to Judge, I feel like there's an important part of his story, or his flashback, that we're missing, and that involves the character of Sanji's mom, Sora. Because it appears that the flashback within the cover story is already over, so I'm not even sure if we're gonna get that here. In fact, I'm not even sure how long this cover story has left. By the way, I'm not asking for a family tree, like the one that Oda decided to include in the most recent SBS about Zoro, because apparently he thought that that information wasn't important enough, or relevant enough to include 
include in the main story. Just like he didn't think that it was important to reveal that Tama was actually a Kurozumi in the main story either. No, that stuff wasn't relevant enough. But you do know what was? Characters running up and down stairs and hallways. Ice Oni Bullets antidote chase game. Raizo and Fukurukuju shenanigans. Momonosuke trying to produce dragon flame clouds for at least over a dozen chapters. ZP0 sitting in a room keeping track of the army numbers on a go board. I'm not even going to include the Big Mom Amnesia plotline into this list because that happened before Onigashima, but I'm sure you get my point. Anyway, when it comes to Zoro's heritage, if I were to give you the Spark Notes version of it, the stuff that was the most important from a story standpoint is number one the fact that Zoro's parents both of them are no longer alive also that Zoro is a Shimotsuki from his grandmother's side Zoro's grandmother was the older sister of Shimotsuki Yoshimaru who was the former daimyo of Ringo and he's also the man who Yamato met in the cave so Ushimaru and Zoro's grandmother were siblings and they were also both direct descendants of Ryuma which also technically means that Zoro is a descendant of Ryuma as well he has Ryuma's blood in him. And so something cool here is that aside from Ryuma and maybe Ushimaru, Zoro doesn't seem to have a whole lot of renowned or famous blood in him. It's not like his family tree is full of prodigies or anything like that. And so if you've read Monsters, which is a one-shot featured in the Wanted collection of Oda's stories, which actually features Ryuma, in that story the antagonist is this guy called Shirano or Serrano, and he kind of looks like Mihawk. And so now that we have confirmation that Ryuma and Zoro are related, the first time I read that story, I did think to myself, I wonder if there's a connection between Serrano and Mihawk. Because the thing about Serrano is that in the story, he's supposed to be like this really great swordsman, but he turns out to be a fraud. And so depending on how much of this story Oda wants to incorporate into One Piece, if it does turn out that Shirano and Mihawk are related, I think that would be a cool way of Oda to show that it doesn't really matter what your family tree looks like. And so in that sense, we can view Mihawk as the one who's making up for his ancestor, Shirano, being a fraud during the time when Ryuma was alive. Now in my Nami video that I made recently, there was actually a comment stating that there's actually four national treasures or artifacts that have been referred to as being national treasures. The first one is the Tamatabako box. The next one is the secret national treasure of Marijoa. The third one is the dress that Nami wears uh, that is given to her by the minx in Zo. And then the fourth national treasure that we've heard about in the world of One Piece that was pointed out to me by a viewer was Shusui. So Ryuma's blade was actually considered to be a national treasure as well. And I think that goes along perfectly with what I was saying about how, in Oda's mind, he gives specific and special importance to the original three. Because I think the Tamatebaku box is connected to Joy Boy. Because I think Joy Boy created double fruits, but then given that if you eat a double fruit, you lose your ability to swim, he actually gave the Tamatebaku box to the fishmen as a substitute for double fruits. That way they would gain strength without losing their ability to swim. It's kind of like a, a substitute for double fruits for fishmen. Because if you take the pills from the box, your eyes go red and your hair turns white, just like Joy Boy or like Nika. So from that, we can sort of speculate there being a connection between the four national treasures of the world of One Piece and some godlike beings of the past. Tamatebaku box, sun god Nika, Nami's dress, I think, belonged to an ancient goddess of sorts, maybe like a weather goddess. Zoro used to have Shusui, which belonged to Ryuma, who was known as the god of the blade. And then finally, Doflamingo says in Dress Rosa that if you combine the secret national treasure of Marijoa with the immortality surgery of the Opi Opi no Mi, you essentially gain the power to rule over the world. And on a similar note, I think that's why we're getting the sort of reminder of O'Hara in this chapter, because Sentomaru says that what's going to happen in Egghead is going to be a lot worse than that. So that could imply that maybe Emu eventually uses the weapon that was used to erase Lelucia Kingdom, because the Buster Call in O'Hara was bad, but it didn't really erase the island off the map. In fact, there was a giant pool of books that the giants were able to save afterwards. So if Imu uses the weapon here, it would be more monumental. Now, right before this arc started, we got two chapters, 1059 and 1060. So I feel like Oda was using those two chapters to prepare us for the rising action or for the main conflict of Egghead. Because now we're going to deal with the consequences of the Mero Mero no Mi. And we're also contemplating the possibility of Egghead being wiped off the map, just like Lelucia Kingdom was. This was a pretty tough chapter for Usopp especially coming off of Wano and the way that he was handled there, you know, just to come to Egghead to be turned to stone, it's tough. So, moment of silence for the way that Usopp has been handled since Wano. 
At least we get the aww expression there with both him and Lilith, which makes it clear and obvious that they're turning into stone because they find S. Snake to be adorable. It's like they're staring at a very cute puppy. Now in the official translation, it just says, he he he, or he he. Moment of silence for the way that Usopp has been handled since Wano. Long story short, I really do hope that Oda does something to redeem the way that he's been handling Usopp. And the reason why I'm being a little bit more forgiving here is because I remember back in Dressrosa, I got really upset. I was so angry when Usopp ran away, when the Tontadas were crying out for help. I was really upset about that. But then eventually Oda turned it around because Usopp came back to help and then he ended up saving the toys, he freed the toys, and then he also ended up awakening Hockey to save Luffy. So that's kind of what I'm latching on to right now. I hope that Oda does something similar with him. Shaka gets shot in the face by the end, and I can't wait for the big reveal of it being either Hattori or Caribou. I mean, I'm kind of joking, but we did see Caribou using a flintlock back in Sabodi Archipelago. According to the official translation, the place or the floor where Shaka finds the Stella, the main Vegapunk, is called the Old Double Fruit Research Lab. And so if that's the old lab, I'm guessing that that means that there's also a new Double Fruit Research Lab that we'll see in the story at some point. And maybe that's where Logia Double Fruits are being experimented on, or you know that's where Vegapunk is trying to decipher them, because Logias are the only ones that he can't replicate. The fight against the Seraphim continues to very little avail, although I must say that I do appreciate the implied amount of coordination in the attacks of Luffy and Luchi and Zoro and Kaku. So in Japanese, the attack that Luchi is using is called Shigan Oden. So Shigan Oden sounds a little bit similar to Kong Organ. So in Japanese, the attacks not only look similar, but they also kind of sound similar as well. And of course, Albert slash King being the Lunarian that was used to create the Seraphim in the first place was a very popular conclusion that a lot of us had arrived at previously. So this chapter ends up confirming that, kind of gets played for laughs. And something worth remembering here is that if the Lunarian flame is off, that's when they're vulnerable, but it's also when their speed increases. We kind of get an example of this after Nami attacks S-Shark with Zeus, because even though the attack probably didn't do too much, I'm pretty sure that S-Shark didn't enjoy it, because after that he resorts to sneaking up on Nami from behind, and he doesn't have his flame activated once he gets out of the ground. So he deactivated the flame when he was swimming around, and then just popped up with a sneak attack. Now the last time we saw Sanji, he was on the second floor with Stussy and Jinbei, and Nami is currently on the third floor, which means that Sanji had to rush up to protect her. And last chapter, Zoro said that he had heard Nami scream, so I'm pretty sure that that scream was Sanji's cue to go upstairs to protect Nami. I noticed that Brooke was about to launch an attack called Obado Kub Droid, which we saw Ryuma use in Thriller Bark, and Brooke has used it in the past as well. But then he noticed Sanji rushing through the air and he's like, oh, okay, I'll just stop myself right there. There are several important narrative reasons for why I think Oda is having Sanji fight S-Shark. And one of them I think is for Sanji to beat the number four joke allegations once and for all by defeating a Jinbei clone. But then also S-Shark's double fruit power ties in with Sanji as well. So if you remember back in Thriller Bark, Sanji had this grudge against Absalom because Absalom had eaten the Suka Suka no Mi, which Sanji said that he wanted to use so that he could watch women bathe. Now despite Sanji not being able to eat the clear clear fruit, he eventually does gain the power to become invisible via the raid suit and he does eventually sneak inside one of the women's baths in Wano. But then even after he lets go of the raid suit and destroys it, according to Queen, Sanji is so fast that he can turn invisible to the naked eye. So he kind of ends up getting the ability that he wanted to some degree. And I'm bringing this up because in the SBS for volume 98, Oda said that if Sanji were to become a double fruit user, he would have Senior Pink's swim swim fruit because it would allow him to slip through walls or swim on the ground. So it would basically allow Sanji to use his speed to his full potential because he wouldn't have to worry about running into solid objects. So he would be able to face through walls. So it's not just interesting that Sanji is currently up against the double fruit power that Oda said that would fit him the most, or that he would have if he were to become a double fruit user, but the fact that it seems that Seraphim Jinbei is taking full advantage of his Lunarian speed when he's underwater by deactivating his flame could make for a very intriguing match. Because I don't think Sanji currently knows about Lunarians being vulnerable when they don't have their flame on, so I'm really curious as to how he's gonna be able to figure out that weakness. And so this reminds me of the most recent SBS where Oda once again dropped a hint about Sanji being a Lunarian, or at least having some Lunarian blood in him. 
Because according to a translation by Ed and Bobby, Oda said that Sanji, even without his Germa powers, which he was finally able to activate in Wano because of using the Raid Suit, but even without those powers, Sanji from the get-go, from the start, Sanji has always had a fascinating and unnatural resistance to fire. This goes back to what Queen says when he notices that Sanji can ignite himself. He says the only people capable of bursting into flame like that are Lunarians, which is why I would have loved to have gotten more information from the cover story on Judge and Sora's relationship. You know, what brought them together? Because they seem to have had very different values and very different moral compasses. So was this an arranged marriage or did they actually genuinely care about each other at one point in time? Another name for Judge is Garuda, right? And Garuda is the name of a mythical bird in Buddhism. According to the One Piece wiki, the kanji used uh, to spell out Garuda in the manga means mysterious bird. And then of course we also know that the name Sora means sky. And there's also that weird picture of Sanji with wings that Oda drew for volume 47, where he calls him an alien and uses him to depict a UFO. And one of the questions that I've brought up that I think really needs to be explained at some point is, what is the connection? What is the relationship between the people with white wings that we've seen live in Sky Islands, like in Skypea, right? What is the relationship between those winged people and the Lunarians that can ignite, that can produce fire from their bodies? And could it be that maybe Sanji is the missing link to that connection? Like if we were to go far enough into Sanji's family tree, would we eventually find that a Lunarian married a Skypean? Also, speaking of Sanji fighting Jinbei Seraphim, we know that the main reason for why Sanji wants to find the All Blue is because that's the place where fish from all four seas intersect. Now, there's an old theory from Arlong Park forums that says that if you destroy the Red Line, that actually ends up creating the All Blue because it causes all four seas to come together. So if it does turn out that Sanji does have some Lunarian blood in him, it would be kind of poetic that that's the place that he wants to find given that we know that Lunarians used to live at the top of the red line. So what do you guys think? Do you guys think that we'll ever get an upgrade from Black Leg Sanji to Black Wing Sanji? So I think that if you've been reading One Piece long enough, you'll definitely notice a theme in, in the way that Oda sort of uses imagery, specifically the imagery of, of birds and, and people with wings and winged creatures to sort of symbolize freedom, sort of like the next step in human evolution, if you will, which you know, it could be the next step in human evolution, but it also could mean that this is where humans came from, right? At least when it comes to the story of One Piece. And so I read a couple of things recently that I want to share with you to support this. One of them is sort of like the blurb at the beginning of one of the volumes. And Oda says this, this is from volume 39. He says, birds sure have it good, don't they? They can fly around in the sky freely. According to one scholar's calculations, if humans built up their chest muscles to a thickness of two meters, we'd be able to fly too. Now, I've actually seen another translation of this blurb, and instead of using the word scholar, it uses the word scientist. Scholars or scientists say some crazy things sometimes. Huh. And of course, this whole thing reminds me of Sanji being able to unlock Skywalk during the time skip. This is another thing I found. So in the SBS section for volume 41, a fan asks Oda, do you think it's possible to will yourself to fly through the sky? And then Oda answers, ages ago, people did fly across the skies. One day, someone said, you can't fly in the sky. And people lost their ability to fly because they lost their wings, also known as faith. So maybe we can trace all of the races in one piece as being from the moon originally or you know, being able to fly and having wings originally. This whole thing reminds me of Strong World, which is a movie that Oda was heavily involved in. He even wrote it. And in that movie, there are people that want to be free. They want to escape Shiki's rule and domain. And so they wish to become birds. And by the end of the movie, they end up growing wings. And so maybe that's why Oda has been very careful about not showing too much of Urouge. He's like the last supernova that we need to learn more about. And maybe the reason for why it's taken this long for him to have a space in the story is because he actually knows a bunch of spoilers. That is gonna do it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching and for all of your support with these videos that I make. I hope you have a great week. Take care. Catch you guys later. Bye.